Hi guys, welcome back to Undressing the Issue. I'm Julia, your host. Uh, This is my podcast where I talk about all things having to do with sex, sexuality, addiction, trauma, all of that good stuff. So today, I wanted to give a brief overview for you guys because I hear a lot from people, you know, I think that my partner, my ex, whoever has a sex addiction or is a sex addict, and I want to get clear on what exactly sex addiction is. Like, what what do I look at when I try to determine if somebody has a sexual addiction? So, let's begin. So, just to give you a brief overview, basically, there are certain things that come with sex addiction. And much like any other addiction, these things are sort of universal for for addiction in general. So developing a tolerance is one of those things. So needing to use more and to do more in greater intensity to receive the same desired effect, to achieve arousal, to achieve orgasm, to get that sense of reward, release, satisfaction. So tolerance is one of the things. Withdrawal is another one of those things. Now, we hear about withdrawal in reference to alcohol, heroin, that kind of thing where you see physical symptoms. However, with sex addiction, it's a little bit different. So with sex addiction, the withdrawal is more of a state of distress after the high subsides. So what I mean by that is basically uh, it can be emotional, psychological. There's an increase in anxiety, trouble sleeping, irritability, depressive symptoms, uh, uneasiness, things like that, difficulty focusing. So this is what we're talking about with withdrawal. Then another thing that sex addiction people with these addictions are going to have is doing more than they intend to do so this is that compulsivity aspect where i didn't intend to sit for six and a half hours you know watching pornography and masturbating i my intention was to spend 20 minutes max but i ended up spending my entire day on this or you know i my intention wasn't necessarily to um engage in high risk sexual activities i was just sort of looking to uh interact with somebody get some validation but that's where it ended up another thing that um I see is a lot of failed attempts to regulate one's behaviors. So, you know, the the old, you know, I, I told myself I was going to stop, but I couldn't stop. And having this happen at least once where I, I told myself I'm not going to do this, but I ended up doing it anyway. And I feel bad that, you know, I did and I feel like I can't control it. Um, a lot of time spent preoccupied with uh, the behavior, with being able to engage in it, with recovering from it. So this is where it's a little bit obsessive, where it takes up a lot of our bandwidth, our mental bandwidth. Either we're trying, either we're fantasizing about the last time we've done this, or we're fantasizing and thinking about how we could get to do this, or We've just done this and we're spending a lot of time and energy trying to cover our tracks, clean up the mess we've made, um, talk ourselves out of feeling terrible about it, that kind of thing, which is universal for really any addiction. I mean, somebody who has a drug addiction um, or even any type of substance addiction can speak to how much time they spend either using their substance of choice, trying to get it, meaning, you know, is my dealer available? Is the liquor store open? Do I have money for it? And then recovering from the use, whether that is because of, you know, the withdrawal or um, it made me sick 
or whatever the case may be. So another thing that I see with sex addiction is that somebody with an addiction has a reduction in other important activities because they're so preoccupied with their addiction. So for example, leisure activities, hobbies, interests, spending time, socializing. There's a lot of isolation that often comes with addiction. Um, so this can also affect, you know, your work. I'm, I should have put in more time than I did today, but I had a hard time focusing or, you know, I skipped a meeting that I probably should have gone to because I was busy acting out. So that's another important factor. And I think the other big thing is continuing to engage in the behavior even when you experience negative consequences. So it's it would seem kind of uh, like a duh to most people that if I am having negative consequences, that I would just stop the behavior because I don't want to deal with the consequences because they suck. But that is sort of the the irony of addiction is that it's irrational in that way. A rational person says, well, you know, this bad thing happened because I did X, Y, Z, so I'm not going to do that again. But for somebody with an addiction, it's, yeah, this bad thing happened, but I'm still going to continue doing this and I can't really stop it. So that's just a little general overview. But as in terms of what sex addiction actually is, the psychology behind it, you know, Patrick Carnes, you probably heard me mention him before. He's kind of like the father of sex addiction treatment. He has written about sex addiction extensively and he describes it as a pathological relationship with a mood altering experience. So basically this mood altering experience itself is not necessarily the bad thing. We all engage in mood altering experiences. Case in point, for example, during this quarantine, uh, Many of us, including myself, are probably binging TV, streaming services, Netflix, things like this. That is mood altering. It is a distraction. It takes us out of, you know, our day to day, our stress, our anxiety. We can get lost in the plot lines of whatever terrible show we're watching because at this point I feel like I finished Netflix and there's nothing left. But that's an aside. Anywho. Um, basically, it's a pathological relationship. That's where the problem lies, is the relationship with this experience, with this behavior that creates an alteration in our mood, okay? So basically, with sex addiction, like any addiction, it involves sexuality. So a person loses their ability to control one or more elements of their sexuality causing negative consequences to themselves. So it's not necessarily that being sexual, having urges, being horny, having a sex drive, that's not bad. And I want to be really clear about this because sex addiction therapists catch a bad rap for this reason. So it's not that we consider sexuality a bad thing or even sexual expression in all of its many forms. It's when that behavior and that expression starts causing negative consequences to the person engaging in it or to their relationships or to their daily life and functioning. That's when we start looking at it as problematic, what's really going on. Because remember, with sex addiction treatment, unlike with substance use treatment, the name of the game is not abstinence. That's what it is with alcohol, with drugs. There is no actual legitimate reason to need to use drugs 
illicit drugs, street drugs, or alcohol. Some people can do it socially. Some people enjoy it once in a while, but it's not like it's something that you need. It's not a necessity for survival and to stay alive. However, when it comes to behavioral addictions or what's also called a process addiction, so food addictions, sex addictions, exercise addictions, work addictions, we're not trying to get the person to completely abstain from those like we are with substance addictions. What we're actually looking at here is their relationship with this behavior. So it's not about all or nothing. It's about changing the relationship with this behavior into a healthier one. Very, very simply put. So the other thing to remember is that sex addiction is also an intimacy problem. Most sex addicts really do crave intimacy, but for whatever reason, whether it's trauma or it's their upbringing or it's anything at all, conditioning over time, they're terrified of it. So it's kind of, well, it's not kind of, it is an intimacy disorder. So in general, the three main factors that I look for to diagnose, this is the criteria I'm looking for to diagnose sex addiction, is the compulsivity, number one, that loss of control, doing more than we intend to, trying to stop but we can't. The second factor is continuing with this behavior despite the negative consequences. So even if I've lost my job because I've been downloading porn on my work computer or I have lost my marriage because my spouse got sick of me cheating or I contracted STDs or I got arrested while trying to solicit a prostitute or I was publicly exposed <laughs> and it was all over the news that I was having multiple affairs, uh, Harvey Weinstein, what? Um, continuing to do so, even though I've incurred these negative consequences. And the last factor, the third one, is the preoccupation, the obsession with it. The time spent, the inability to engage in anything else, that sort of thing. Those are the three main factors. So the loss of control, the continuation despite the negative consequences, and the preoccupation or the obsession. That's what I look for. So... I want to be clear that sex addiction, huge misconception, is that sex addicts are people who can't get enough sex. They just want to have sex all day long, all the time, repeatedly, nonstop, just sex, sex, sex in whatever form, whether it's sex with myself, sex with another person, sex with toys, it doesn't matter. So that's not necessarily the case. So... Yes, that can be part of it. Um, it can be masturbation, sexual relationships with multiple partners, oftentimes in secrecy, pornography use. And another form is pornography collection, even if we're not masturbating to it. So viewing pornography or collecting pornography without masturbating, when it gets to the point where it's obsessive and we lose control over it, we spend hours on it and it is costing us some losses, some negative consequences, that's when it starts to become problematic. Uh, paying for sex is a common one. So going to strip clubs, prostitutes, massage parlors, Another big one these days is virtual sex. So things like, you know, cam camming, you know, cam girls, paying for that kind of thing. And another big thing going on right now is teledildonics. So teledildonics, it's kind of a cool word. <laughs> I'm sure you guys have heard of things like a vibrator that your partner can control remotely while you wear it. That's an example of teledildonics, but that world has 
expanded far beyond something as simple as a remote controlled <laughs> vibrator. And it's a whole thing. Google it um, unless you have, you know, uh, parent settings on <laughs> your internet browsers. But it's it's kind of a cool thing. And there are some really awesome uses for this, for enhancing your relationship, your sexuality. But when it, again, when it becomes obsessive and problematic, that's when we start raising eyebrows and going, hmm, wonder if there's a problem. Um, anonymous hookups and sex, voyeurism, exhibitionism. These are all examples of compulsive sexual behaviors. Now, voyeurism and exhibitionism are a little bit different because they can also be offending behaviors, not just um, addictive behaviors. So with voyeurism, if you're like, for example, being a peeping Tom, that's a massive boundary violation. And it, the, it doesn't involve the consent of the person who's being observed. So that would be considered an offender behavior. Um, same thing with exhibitionism. If you're going to go flash, you know, a bunch of people in a park, again, you don't have their consent. And that can be really traumatic for them. So it's that consent piece that... Um, basically makes you tread into offender waters but you can engage in offender behavior and have those behaviors be compulsive for you it can be both so i want to get clear though the difference between a sex addict and a sex offender um is that with a sex addict yes the behavior is compulsive and it can become unmanageable but it usually does involve the consent of the other participant. Now, this is something that is debatable because people will say, well, if you're soliciting a prostitute and the prostitute is being trafficked and maybe has a pimp who's abusive, is that really consent? Well, that's up for debate. That's up for debate. So, you know, the person who's soliciting this prostitute could say, well, to me, the prostitute expressed consent. What happens behind the scenes, I don't know about. And this is where it gets kind of dark. So in theory, this is the case. However, sex offenders often refuse to get consent. So their intention is to violate boundaries. It's to exploit someone, it's to humiliate someone, to be brutal to someone. There's sort of a sadistic nature there. A lot of sex offenders will present with symptoms of antisocial personality disorder, which is uh, sociopathology, a sociopath, and they often lack empathy, like completely. Not everybody who lacks empathy or struggles with empathy as a sociopath. Let's be clear on that. <laughs> Don't start, you know, diagnosing somebody who you think lacks empathy. They're not necessarily sociopathic, but, you know, there it could be any number of reasons, but people who engage in offending behavior typically lack empathy. For them, it's hard to empathize with the fact that the person that they're offending on is suffering in the process. And just to be clear, the treatment for offenders is a little bit different from the treatment that we usually provide for people with addictions. So some examples of sex addicts that you guys have probably heard of, it's been all over the news. So Tiger Woods, Hugh Grant, uh, Paul Rubens, Jared Fogle, um, and We've all heard of different sex offenders, too, in the news, like Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, Josh Duger. So we do hear about this. And yes, the public, you know, humiliation and uh, exposure is a negative consequence of their behavior. But they do require different types of treatment. So I want to talk a little bit about also, what the profile is of a sex addict. So why does somebody turn to sex? How does a sex addiction develop? 
So there's a number of reasons. The obvious one is trauma or a history of abuse. Another big one is early attachment wounds. So having a distant parent, having an addicted parent, having an over-involved parent, maybe some type of abandonment. Um, another factor is trauma repetition. So having had trauma, um, some people engage in repeating the trauma, meaning creating a scenario that's similar to their original trauma. And in this case, they're in control. So it's seemingly them kind of taking back their power in the same situation. However, it's still a repetition of their trauma and that can be uh, unhealthy. Um, another reason, and this is actually quite common with pornography addiction is comforting. Um, so, with pornography use, it's a behavior you engage in alone, by yourself, without anybody else. It's kind of like self-soothing. So it's, you know, a coping skill. It's a distraction. I get to not have to think about, you know, the things that are stressing me out or bringing me down. Um, and it can also be comforting in terms of getting attention from another person if it's not with pornography. Um, that external validation component can feel like nurturing. So that's another reason why some people turn to sex. Um, it can also be a coping skill in terms of a way to regulate emotions, right? I've had a rough day. I want to take the edge off. It'd be great to just have some type of release. And so I turn to sex for that. Um, we talked about comforting. Another form of the comforting is escapism, is numbing and escape. So the other piece of it is it's pseudo intimacy. I did mention that, you know, people with sex addictions crave intimacy, but are scared of it for whatever reason. So in engaging in addictive behaviors, it's kind of like a way to have this temporary fake intimacy in a way but it's with someone I don't really know very well and don't necessarily need to get to know or allow to get to know me. So I get to kind of play pretend for a little while. Um, another component of why people turn to sex is, well, the internet. <laughs> it's accessible, it's affordable, it's anonymous, and there is an addictive component to that. So these are all, well, they're just some of the reasons why people turn to sex. Um, I think as far as sex addicts, their profile, how they appear, they're typically very charming. Um, they're typically kind of social, outgoing, and this is for sex addicts, not pornography addicts. Pornography addicts often go the other way. They're risk averse, so they may be a little bit shy. They may be a little bit withdrawn, not very talkative, not very expressive, versus the sex addict who goes and picks up women for one night stands or, uh, you know, engages in more uh, high risk behaviors usually the profile is a little bit different. So those are the people who are more outgoing, more sociable, who want to be well-liked, highly regarded. They want to be, uh, you know, a, a stand-up person. They want to be a character that is sort of magnetic and it provides them with validation versus somebody with uh, pornography addiction who is risk averse. And oftentimes it comes from uh, some type of attachment issue, whether it's an avoidant attachment style, difficulty with attaching, fear, anxiety, that kind of thing. So this is kind of a really quick run through on the basics of what is sex addiction? How does it develop? What is a sex addict profile? Um, you guys hear me talk about sex addiction quite a bit, so I do feel like it's necessary to give you guys sort of a brief overview and summary of what I look at, how I see it, 
what I'm referring to. So as always, feel free to give me feedback. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you next time.